Good morning. Welcome to the Austin chapter of Reasons to Believe. And uh, I really appreciate everybody joining us this morning. This is our first live presentation on our YouTube channel. Last month we did a presentation virtually that was done remotely. Uh, but this is the first time where the officers and myself and our speaker are live in the same room. And so thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to open this morning with a word of prayer, if you'll bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this weekend where we can gather together and we can join and learn more about you and your creation. At this very trying and challenging time, we do ask that you be with our world, national, state, and local leaders as they develop policies that govern our lives and our livelihoods. Please give them wisdom and insight. As well as our healthcare workers and hospitals, please help us to continue to keep them supplied with uh, with an abundant amount of personal protection equipment. Please let them know how much we appreciate the job that they are doing. Please be with our scientists and biotech companies as they are continuing to research and find cures and therapies. Please continue to give them wisdom insight. And please continue to be with humanity as a whole as that we will continue to be loving and gracious to our fellow humans and that we will reach out and care for those who are in need, and that we will be uh, respectful uh, of them and ourselves as we all try to manage this uh, and through this together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, uh, last month we were very honored to have Jay Werner Wallace, who uh, spoke with us. Originally, we were going to have him live here in Austin, but uh, just a couple of weeks or maybe even 10 days before he was going to present. Uh, <laughs> the way things have happened this year, no plan is safe. And uh, so fortunately, we were able to scramble and put that together. His presentation is on our YouTube channel. So uh, the Austin chapter of Reasons to Believe does have a YouTube channel. Hopefully you know that because you're watching it at this time. And so his presentation is still available there if you'd like to go back and see that. As well, if you're here now, uh, please be sure to subscribe to our channel. That way you will get notifications anytime we have a new video that's popping up. We do intend to have uh, question and answers uh, live after this presentation, so do make a note of our email address, which is reasons TB Austin, reasons to believe Austin. So reasons TB Austin at yahoo.com. And uh, be prepared to uh, send in your questions. As the presentation is ongoing, write down your question. Uh, if you want to go ahead and prepare it and send it in so that we'll have it ready at the end of the, the uh, presentation, please feel free to do so. So next month, we're very excited to have Dr. Sarah Salviander come and speak. Like J. Werner Wallace last month, Dr. Salviander is a former atheist. She became a theist through her doctorate doctrinal studies. Uh, the teleological argument is what convinced her. Now, she probably didn't know what the teleological argument was, but it was her studies in astronomy that convinced her that there must be a designer, that there must be a God behind it all, and that led to her conversion to Christianity. And so she's going to be talking about a subject that she's become very passionate about here recently, and that is how should we look at Genesis 1? She's going to be looking at two perspectives, both the ancient and the supernatural perspective, as well as the modern and the material perspective. Now, next month, and probably next month only, for at least for the near term, we are going to open it up for people to join us here live at the Ministry Center of Main Street Baptist Church in Georgetown. Dr. Salviander would prefer to have a live audience to speak to, so if you would like to come to next month's meeting, we will have an address and you certainly can attend. Everyone's going to be asked to bring masks and to wear those masks while indoors. And if you are 60 or 65 or older, then you might consider just going ahead and staying home and watching this on YouTube. We're not going to prevent anyone from coming if they absolutely want to be here, but uh, one of the things that we have learned that is that uh, this virus is more deadly the older you are. So again, if you're 60 or 65 or older, we would certainly encourage you to uh, give that some thought and maybe uh, consider staying home for that. So we're very much looking forward to her next month, which we will meet on our regular second Saturday, September the 12th. 
Then in October, we're going to meet on the third Saturday. So that's going to be a departure from our normal second Saturday. And I'm going to be giving my presentation, The Theology of String Theory. We're going to be taking a look at the biblical implications of extradimensionality. And uh, this is a presentation that I probably had the most people contact me in regard, asking if I had a recording of this. I've given it several times in the past, and I don't have a recording, so this seems to be a good time to, to present it again and offer a recording. As a part of this, I highly recommend that you consider watching the PBS Novus special, The Elegant Universe, hosted by Brian Greene. Uh, this is a three-hour documentary, so there's three parts, one hour each, and this will help to lay sort of a foundational knowledge for the theoretical, theological concepts that we will be discussing during this presentation. So that's in about two months. You have plenty of time. You can get that, uh, that DVD at the library. You can order it through Amazon. It's even available online if you go to the PBS website. And uh, I think there are other uh, venues as well, possibly YouTube. So again, looking forward to that in October. And then in November, we're going to have Dr. Brandon Riddell join us. Dr. Riddell is the president of the Houston chapter of Reasons to Believe, but he's also a scientist who works at the Johnson NASA Space Center in Houston. So he's going to be talking about the International Space Station. He's going to give us an overview of the space station and also talk about some of the ongoing research that's currently being conducted so we'll return to our normal second Saturday, November the 14th, uh, to have Dr. Riddell here. So please be sure to uh, mark your calendars. If you would like to know more about future presentations and you want to get on our email list, please be sure to send us an email at reasonstbaustin at yahoo.com, and uh, we'll add you to that list. That way you'll know what's coming in advance, and we have all of these posted on the website as well. So this morning, we are very excited to have Dr. Roberts here from Baylor University. And so, as I was telling him this morning, originally we had him scheduled to speak here in May. But when J. Warner Wallace confirmed for July, I wanted to have a lineup of speakers following J. Warner Wallace that anyone who was in attendance would see those upcoming presentations and think, wow. There, there are more presentations. I need to come, and, and really, I ought to join. And so Dr. Marks was very gracious to move this presentation to August so that we could attempt to accomplish that. And again, we're not able to meet live and in person, so the best plans have uh, gone to waste again. However, very thankful to have him continue to honor his commitment to come and speak to us. So Dr. Marks is the Distinguished Professor of Engineering in the Department of Engineering and Computer Science at Baylor University. Marx is Editor-in-Chief of Biocomplexity and the former Editor-in-Chief of the IEEE Transactions on Neural Networks. Marx has contributed to numerous books, including Neural Smithing, Supervised Learning in Feedforward Artificial Neural Networks. And so Today, he's going to, you can see that he's abundantly qualified to speak on the topic today, which is going to be talking about human exceptionalism. He's going to be taking a look at things that we do that artificial intelligence never will. He'll explore the question, can humans duplicate humans using artificial intelligence? And a spoiler alert, the answer is going to be no. Not now, not ever. This should be a very thought-provoking subject, and uh, thank you for joining us. Dr. Marks, please, thank, thank you, you for coming. Gosh, what a, what a joy it is to be here. As, um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I'm the uh, director of the Walter Bradley Center of Natural and Artificial Intelligence under Discovery Institute, and I need to start my timer here. There we go. And uh, Walter Bradley is a member of Main Street Baptist Church, so, uh, uh, so hopefully he's home and watching. He's recovering from some surgery now, but um, let me see if I can control the slides here. You can see that there is a, if you will, a brush of greatness that I had with both Dr. Bradley on the right and, of course, everybody knows who's in the center, the uh, origin 
and the founder of Reasons to Believe, which is Hugh Ross. In fact, Hugh has worked with Walter quite a bit. We're putting forward in the Bradley Center a biography of Dr. Bradley, and uh, Dr. Ross has written a nice uh, commentary on his ministry that he has done with Dr. Bradley. So with that, let me go into the topic that we want to talk about. As mentioned, I have a background in artificial intelligence. I've been doing it for like 40 years and have been keeping up with it. I publish a lot of papers. Some of my papers are pretty good. And uh, so I do have a, a, the, uh, the credentials to talk about this, hopefully. Let me start out by saying, let's talk about artificial intelligence, but first let's define it. It's difficult to talk about something without defining. What is artificial intelligence? If you go into the halls of academia, there will be skirmishes as to whether it's artificial intelligence, machine intelligence, computational intelligence. But I think in the media, it's anything that computers do that you look at and you go, gee whiz, that's really amazing. And that's a nice definition that I would like to use. It's anything that computers do, which is kind of amazing. The reason I like this is because the common denominator here is computers. And we can look then at computer science. We can determine what computers can't do. And if computers can't do something, that means that AI can't do it either. Because AI is, is constrained by whatever computers do. Now, we know that there's lots of history of artificial intelligence. Here we have, for example, 20 years ago, Kasparov, who was beaten by the, um, the IBM computer program Deep Blue in chess. Kasparov was a world champion, and he was beaten by Kasparov. This was big news 20 years ago. And so we see the onslaught and the advancement of artificial intelligence. More recently, we have things like IBM Watson, another IBM computer that, that uh, uh, played around with the contestants in Jeopardy. And in Jeopardy, if you've ever watched it, you have these queries and you have to answer these queries with a question. And the, the skill is literally how fast you are in recalling what the answer to the query is. And IBM Watson was able to defeat the world champions at Jeopardy in the game, uh, well, the world champions at Jeopardy. More recently, we have um, the incredible, just astonishing um, ability of a program called AlphaGo to win at the world's most difficult popular board game, which is Go. Most of the West are not, it, are not knowledgeable about Go, but Go is a very difficult game. Go is, Go makes chess like chess makes checkers. In other words, it's much more complicated than chess and was for a long time a, uh, a gauntlet that was being pursued by those in artificial intelligence, and that was achieved by AlphaGo. More recently, we have artificial intelligence beating world champions. At, this kind of surprised me, frankly, but they beat them at Texas Hold'em. So we have computers winning today at Texas Hold'em. There is also a new computer program which has been getting a lot of press lately called GTP3, GTP3. It's the third generation, which is able to, with a little bit of prompting, to write short paragraphs which are highly coherent. In fact, you might have heard about it in the news. They said that this is so dangerous that they're afraid that it will get out and get into bad hands. So there was this talk about banning it, which was uh, totally a bunch of hype. So with all of these advances in uh, artificial intelligence, what are the speculations? People look at the current achievements of artificial intelligence and they look to the future and they try to forecast what is going to happen with artificial intelligence and we get all sorts of different, uh, uh, different takes on it. One of the problems is that many of these speculations are dealt with by what George Gilder, George Gilder, if you don't know, is a technical guru. He's one of the co-founders of Discovery Institute. He calls the speculations based on the ideology of a materialistic superstition, specifically that the brain is a meat computer and can be replicated by artificial intelligence. So this is the assumption they start out with. But a lot of people have bought into this. And let me show you some of the people that have bought into it. Bill Gates, for example, he says, I don't understand why some people are not concerned about artificial intelligence. Now, here's a guy that founded Microsoft that supposedly knows a lot about computers. 
and he is really concerned about artificial intelligence. Then we have incredible gurus like uh, Stephen Hawking, the late Stephen Hawking, who did a lot of stuff, including with Roger Penrose, um, wrote the uh, paper which uh, talked about black hole theory for the first time. He said the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. It would take off on its own and redesign itself uh, at an ever-increasing rate. Humans who are limited by slow biological evolution couldn't compete and would be superseded. In fact, the Google engineer Ray Kurzweil has written a book called The Singularity, and he says that Darwinian evolution has taken us to a certain point where biological improvement is no longer possible, and we are developed to this point in order to uh, better ourselves and go to the next step of evolution by generating AI, which becomes smarter and smarter and smarter. There are some assumptions here, which I will debunk with basic computer science in a few minutes, but that's where Stephen Hawking comes from. And then there's Elon Musk, who said that with artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. Elon Musk, I think, was recently, uh, there, there were headlines that he was currently the seventh most richest guy in the, in the world, seven, $75 billion or something like that. But George Gilder rears his head again, and George Gilder says, I think that, this is in the bottom, I think Elon Musk is a tremendous entrepreneur, yet he's quite a retarded thinker. We see, um, we see in these cases, we see some, uh, some purported experts. If there's questions, Q&A at the end, I can uh, offer suggestions to why these illuminaries have fallen for, this, for the uh, materialist superposition. Superposition. I feel like I'm lecturing uh, on, on systems theory. Um, superstition is what I meant to say. So we're going to talk about a number of things with artificial intelligence. We're going to talk about the media hype associated with it. And then we're going to go back to computer science. We are going to learn in this talk why computers today cannot duplicate humans. And also why computer science says that computers will, and AI will never duplicate humans in the future. Because you tell people that, no, they can't, uh, AI can't duplicate humans today. Yes, but they say they have this thing called algorithm of the gaps, which says someday in the future we'll have a computer smart enough to duplicate humans. No, it isn't possible, and I will give you the arguments for, for that. So before we do that, let's go into some of the, um, so, some of the headlines that, that buy into this idea of the materialistic superstition. We have junk, uh, we have lots of hype and junk news associated with artificial intelligence. Uh, you can see some of, the, some of the headlines that I've gleaned here. In the upper right, how can we prepare for catastrophically dangerous AI and why we can't wait? Many people are, are forecasting a terrible dystopian future where AI just is going to make our lives miserable, and someday we might be pets to our super AI. Um, Let's see, right below that, the truth about killer robots, the year's most terrifying document. Uh, protecting humanity at the bottom, bottom left, protecting humanity in the face of artificial intelligence. Notice there's assumption there that we have to protect humanity against AI. Is that indeed going to be necessary? So why do we have all this junk news? We have it for, um, for reasons which are listed here. First of all, it uses fake news clickbait. There's the old adage in journalism, if it bleeds, it leads. The generalization of that, if it captures your attention, you'll click on it, and all of these uh, websites have ads on them, and if you click on an article, you go there and the ad pops up, and the, and the people that put together the blog or the, or, or the article get paid for you to do that. Another one is untutored journalists. Many journalists don't have any idea about uh, computer science and artificial intelligence and the foundation of, uh, of artificial intelligence. Another one is research promotion. Companies like to get their stuff out. They are gathering uh, capitalization. Many professors are interested in getting further government grants, and so they like to put out their information with a little bit of spin on it, you know, with a little bit of hyperbole. And, of course, we always have the conspiracy nuts, the people that <laughs> go to places like... Uh, Comic-Con, I guess. Uh, and how do they do it? Well, they use, they use um, tools such as, number one, self-seductive uh, semantics. You will see in a lot of these articles, they use words which aren't defined. You've got to define the words. 
They use words like self-aware and consciousness, and they're not defining them. They're just laying them out there and assuming that whatever you interpret them to be, you will also, um, that, that the reader will also do the same thing. They also use seductive optics. Uh, don't have time to talk about that, but uh, seductive optics is kind of like seductive semantics and hidden details. Let me, give you, let me give you a couple of examples in the headlines. Here's one from the Daily Mail. It says, no more secrets. New mind-bending machine can translate your thoughts and display them as text instantly. Notice that the word instantly is capitalized, right? So that means that's really, really important. Well, what they don't tell you is some of the hidden details. First of all, they said they're, they're reporting on a very, uh, very good archival publication which did the work that they're, that, that they're talking about. What they didn't tell you in order to do that work is that they had to cut a flap out of the skull of the human being and place a, uh, an array of electrodes directly on the human brain in order to read the mind. They don't tell you that the amount of thoughts that can be read is just a finite set. They show the people a number of cards with different pictures they train a neural network, in fact, a very low, uh, low neural network, low-level neural network, and uh, then they show the cards again and read the signals and say, oh, he's thinking about a ball, oh, he's thinking about a truck or whatever. The other thing they don't tell you is that it's not transferable. If they did this to me and they read my thoughts and they did it to you and read your thoughts, your mind reader wouldn't work on me and my mind reader wouldn't work on you. So these are all, the, all of the hidden details which should have been uh, reported, but it wasn't because Daily Mail, which is one of the largest circulated uh, periodicals in, in Britain, uh, decided that it wanted to make things hyperbole, uh, hyperbolic. We also, many of you have probably heard about this. Facebook shuts down chatbots that created a secret language. Have anybody heard about that? Okay, maybe, maybe it's, it's a little bit old, but I mean, this is chilling that these two computers were talking to each other and they created a language that couldn't be talked, that couldn't be interpreted by an external viewer. Well, it turned out that it came out a few days later that this was all bunk and that the writer of the software program came out and basically said that. The Facebook AI, AI researcher slams irresponsible report about smart butt experiment. He was doing something, his neural network, his artificial intelligence system went down, he shut it off. And it had nothing to do with what was reported. So the bottom line is to beware of the fake AI news. New topic. I want to talk about the limitations of artificial intelligence and computers currently and in the future. Behind most AI limitations is a single word that needs to be looked at at all the time, all the time when claims are made about the performance of artificial, tele, uh, artificial intelligence. And you know what that word is? It's algorithms. Everything that a computer program does it follows an algorithm, a set of rules. And you can see uh, the definition here. It's a set of rules to be followed in problem-solving operations. It's a recipe. And indeed, the uh, next example we have is a recipe. A recipe is an algorithm. It's a step-by-step -step procedure for doing something. If you want to bake a cake, you have the input to the algorithm, which is a set of ingredients, then you have the algorithm. You can see the steps here. Preheat the oven to 350 degrees. Uh, you mix the batter, you put it in, put the icing on, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's a specified procedure. When I drove here today from Waco, I used Google Maps. Google Maps is another example of an algorithm. It is a step-by-step -step procedure that tells me how to get from point A to point B. I go certain, a certain uh, distance, I turn right, uh, I go another distance and turn left. So it's uh, another example of an algorithm. If you look at a computer page, this is our website, by the way, at the Bradley Center, mindmatters.ai. And at this, uh, at this website, even this, computer, even this computer page, which is generated by a computer, has computer code. If you right-click and hit Show Source, you get on the right the program, the computer program that is used to generate the page. So even blog posts or whatever you read on the net, whatever you see on the internet, does have an algorithm behind it. It does have computer code. Even artificial intelligence 
follows algorithms. This is the simple training of a, um, of a neural network. And the neural network says, as you can probably see in the upper left, it says you have a bunch of inputs. These inputs are fed into a node, and you do something and something, and it, and it spits out a number, and these neurons are connected to other neurons, and they do something. But this is all an algorithm. So even artificial intelligence, the, the mechanics behind artificial intelligence follows an algorithm. This brings us to a very, I think, a very interesting question. Are there things which are non-algorithmic? Are there things, are there any phenomena for which you cannot write a computer program? And it turns out, indeed, there are. And this has astonishing consequences. The first non-algorithmic um, operation of which I'm aware was proposed by Alan Turing. Alan Turing is best known for being on the Benchley Park team that cracked the Enigma code during World War II that helped uh, decode, that helped, uh, that helped interpret the Nazi secret, uh, secret messages. But he was also the father of modern computer science. And one of the things he showed is that you cannot write a computer program to analyze another computer program to say whether that computer program will run or stop, will run forever or stop. So you have a computer program. If you've written computer programs, you know sometimes they loop and they never end, and you have to break in and you have to stop it. And it's very easy to write such programs. One's on your shampoo bottle, right? Uh, wet hair, lather, rinse, repeat. You notice it doesn't say repeat once, right? So a computer program that does this would repeat forever. It would loop forever. That's an example of a program that would, or an algorithm that would loop forever. But you cannot write a computer program to analyze other computer programs. Now the key here is that it has to be an arbitrary computer program that's analyzed. Clearly, if you have a computer program whose first line is write the number three and then stop, that, that program's going to stop. But the key is you can't write this master computer program to look at all computer programs. And this is the tip of the iceberg. Since Turing's work, there has been a bunch of different operations that have been shown in computer science to be non-algorithmic. So don't waste your time trying to write a computer program to do them. You can't do them. It's mathematically proven. This then brings us to a very interesting question. Are there human attributes that are non-algorithmic? Are there things which you and I do, which you and I experience, that are beyond the capability of a computer program, that are on the, beyond the capability of an algorithm? And yes, there are, and I have a list of them here. Qualia, sentience, understanding, emotion, creativity, consciousness. You would include the obvious ones, such as love and compassion, but these are, these are ones which are more, I, I would think, maybe more quantifiable. Now, if you're not familiar with the word qualia, we'll go through a few of these to illustrate why an algorithm won't work. Let's go through qualia first, because I think qualia is maybe the most easily identified. You have the following task. You have a man that's blind since birth. Now, you're looking at this screen, and you're seeing green, right? You see green. You know what the green is, because you and I share an experience of what that green is. But imagine trying to explain to this blind man what green is. You can tell the man the wavelength. You can tell him grass is green, leaves are green. But to actually duplicate the experience that you and I have looking at this and experiencing green is not going to be possible. That qualia effect is never going to be duplicated in the man since he is blind and he has been blind since birth. Now, if we can't explain green to a blind man, how are we going to write experientially to a computer to experience green also? Again, we can give it the, the wavelength and describe, it, uh, describe its characteristics, but the actual experience, the actual qualia, is not duplicatable and therefore is non-algorithmic. Understanding is also non-algorithmic. Understanding is best illustrated by uh, the philosopher John Searle, and this was done, gosh, 40 years ago. He was a philosopher at the beginning of computers, and he offered something called Searle's Chinese Room. 
Now, he chose Chinese because John Searle doesn't know Chinese. He can't write Chinese. He can't read Chinese. He doesn't understand Chinese. But he imagines himself in an isolated room, and in this room, somebody slips in a question which is written in Chinese. Now, Searle looks at it. He says, I don't know what this says. But in this room also is a bunch of file cabinets, and within the file cabinets are a bunch of uh, Chinese questions. And he goes looking through the file cabinet, and he finally finds the question, and he pulls the card out of the file cabinet, and right below the question is the answer. So he takes and he writes down the answer in Chinese, not understanding what it means, and he refiles the card, because you don't want to get your ordering mixed up, and he takes what he wrote down as the answer and slips it through the door. Now think about that. Externally, it would certainly seem that whatever is happening in that room, the person not only knew Chinese, but was able to converse in Chinese and was able to answer maybe historical questions in Chinese. No, Searle had no idea of what he was doing. He was following an algorithm, a table lookup. He had no understanding of what he was doing. So therefore, I maintain that uh, like uh, qualia, understanding is also non-algorithmic. We talked about IBM Watson, um, and IBM Watson beating the champions at Jeopardy. IBM Watson is nothing more than a big Chinese room, except instead of file cameras, IBM Watson had available to him all of the contents of Wikipedia, and then probably more so. More so. so it was in a big Chinese room. So did Watson understand what it was doing in fielding these questions? No, it was following an algorithm which was written by intelligent people, and the process of, um, the process of understanding is uh, not algorithmic. Now here's something which has been called the black energy of artificial intelligence, and that is common sense. AI thus far has no common sense. And this was actually a big problem when uh, IBM Watson was coming to play Jeopardy. The writers of Watson said, we can't have any questions which are ambiguous. The Jeopardy people said, we're not going to cook the questions for you. But I tell you what we'll do. We'll go to an archive of old uh, Jeopardy questions, and we'll use those instead of writing new ones so that, the, so that we can maintain a degree of fairness. And uh, so that was a compromise and an understanding and an admission of the people that were behind IBM Watson that, yeah, you know, there was a problem here and that IBM Watson had common sense. So let's talk about one of the things that uh, common sense, which, which is kind of comically explained. Uh, artificial intelligence can't deal with ambiguity. And so I have Fred Flintstone up here with Barney, and this is an example from one of the Flintstones ex, uh, episodes where Barney got his fingers glued in a bowling ball. And he couldn't get it out, no matter what he did. He tried to pull out his fingers, and it simply didn't work. So uh, Fred said, uh, why don't you go and uh, get a hammer? So Barney went and got a hammer, and when he got back, Fred said, okay, when I nod my head, hit it. When I nod my head, hit it. Now, the ambiguity here is with the vague pronoun it. Did the it refer to the bowling ball or to Fred's head? Now, we know what the answer is. And this is the interesting thing about these common sense sort of uh, questions. We know what the answer is. A computer wouldn't be quite sure. And maybe with a little bit additional context, it could figure it out. But in all of these examples, I'm getting notice that in all the cases, you know what the right answer is, and the wrong answer seems kind of amusing. You're using your common sense, and computers have no common sense, because they have no sense of humor, <laughs> okay? Uh, here, here, here's an example from flubbed headlines. I like this. Uh, Iraqi head seeks arms. Now, you look at that and you think, this has two meanings, doesn't it? But immediately you know which of the meanings is right, correct? We have common sense. A computer would not be so sure. Here's another one. Utah girl does well in dog show, okay? Uh, we know what that means and we know what the incorrect answer is also. Another flubbed headline is... Bar trying to help alcoholic lawyers. And uh, this one I really like. Uh, farmer Bill dies in house. <laughs> Poor Farmer Bill. Uh, so we have these ambiguities which we resolve immediately and we know what the right answer is. Computers will have a more difficult time. 
In a more serious sense, there is something called the Winograd Schema. These are sentences which have built-in ambiguity, and they're presented to computers. Uh, an example is, you can't cut down that tree with this X, it's too small. Now, the big pronoun there is its. Do you think it refers to the tree or the X? It clearly refers to the X, right? The X is too small to cut down the tree. Another example is, the city councilman refused the demonstrators a permit because they feared violence. Who does the they refer to? Does it refer to the city councilman or to the demonstrators? Clearly here it refers to the city councilman. They were the ones that were afraid to give the permit. So again, we can look at these and we know immediately what the correct interpretation is. Computers will have a, very, a much more difficult time. There is something called the Winograd Schema Challenge, which is which is uh, held annually, where in computers, computer people who are engaged in AI try to get together and they look at Winograd schema that they haven't seen before and they try to figure it out. According to Gary Smith's book, The AI Delusion, a wonderful book, um, that they're still only recording a little above 50% accuracy, which is the accuracy that you would get with a coin flip. So currently AI does not have common sense. Maybe someday it will. So let's go to another non-algorithmic computer, um, computer quality, and that is creativity. Computers will never be creative. Now, how do we, how do we figure out what creativity is here? We have to be careful in defining things, and we will define it as we go on, as you'll see. Uh, 1950, Alan Turing presented something called the Turing Test. And the Turing Test basically had you in one room and a computer in the other room, and you converse with the, with the computer, and um, if you couldn't tell it was a computer, it passed the Turing Test. So this has been the litmus test for a long time for creativity, but there's a problem noticed by, noticed by Summer Bringsjord at Rensselaer Polytechnic. He said, uh, Turing's dream is coming only on the strength of clever but shallow trickery. This is on the right. Uh, they know all too well that they have been merely trying to fool those people who interact with their, uh, with their agents into believing that these agents really have minds. In other words, the writers of the AI to pass the Turing test are gaming the system in order to do that. I'll give you an example. Uh, Eugene Guzman, he, this was a few years ago, he was... Uh, he was presented as a 13-year-old Ukrainian uh, boy, and he had conversations with a number of humans, and he passed the, uh, passed the Turing test, according to the majority of the people he interacted with. But notice, even in the title, we see a little bit of gaming here. We see, first of all, he's a 13-year-old. So you know what? If he's not that smart, come on, he's a 13-year-old, right? Also, he's from Ukraine, so if his English isn't perfect, come on. English is his second, uh, second language. We also see in these cases that a lot of times the, um, these chatbots, if you will, use trickery in the Turing test. They, they answer questions with questions if they have no idea how to respond otherwise. So Bringsjord gave what I believe is the definitive definition of creativity for a computer. Creativity would be demonstrated when a machine's performance is beyond the explanation of its creator. Creativity will be demonstrated when a machine's performance is bond beyond the explanation of its creator or somebody with uh, equivalent knowledge. Now, in the playing of Go with Lee Sedell, uh, the, the AlphaGo computer program made this astonishing move, and everybody's in the audience, their jaws dropped. They said, what's going on here? Well, later analysis showed it was a, it was a pretty good move. It was very unconventional. But one of the things in creativity should not, be, should not be confused with surprise. This was a surprise move. But computers give surprising results all the time. Uh, this was not, a, again, an example of creativity. AlphaGo was trained to play Go. That's what it was doing. If you go up to AlphaGo and you said, explain me the rules of Go, it can't do that because it wasn't programmed to do that. 
If you go up and ask a drastic question, can you help me with my taxes? It won't even, it won't even know how to respond. It only does what it's programmed to do. So for this reason, I really enjoy the Lovelace test. I think it's, uh, I think it's the definitive test for how creativity should be gauged in artificial intelligence. Thus far, no computer program, no artificial intelligence has admittedly uh, passed the Lovelace test. Nobody has made a claim that it has passed the Lovelace test. So in finishing, I'd like to address some common questions which are asked about artificial intelligence. You see these in the, in the headlines. Uh, number one, can AI create music? You've heard about artificial intelligence creating music. Let me tell you a common scenario of artificial intelligence creating music. You are given a genre, for example, of Bach, and you train the neural network with all sorts of Bach music. And then you ask the computer program to write something. Guess what it writes? It writes something that sounds like Bach. It takes all of that information and interpolates among all of the information. It will never be creative in the sense of creating music like a Richard Wagner or one of my favorite, the chaotic Charles Ives. It will, never, it will never go beyond that. It is constrained to generate music of the type that it is, um, that it is trained with. And so, no, AI can't create music. It can only look at music and mimic that music. Can AI create art? Here is shown a portrait which was, was, which was sold at Christie's for $475,000. It was generated by artificial intelligence. Well, guess how this was trained? The AI looked at all sorts of portraits of classical painters such as Rembrandt. And they, they, they learned all of this. So guess what the computer program did? It generated something which was in the spirit of these classical um, classical. Um, classical paintings and classical portraits. I don't know for sure, but I would bet you that none of Picasso's cubist work was put in there, nor uh, Pollock's, uh, where he splattered paint all over the place. I bet you none of his paintings were in there. It was all portraits. And again, you get out basically what you put in. So this was an interpolation. You've heard of the idea of thinking outside the box. Computers don't have the idea of thinking outside the box. It turns out creativity, if you look at the great creative minds of the past, creativity literally, um, I shouldn't say literally, but often requires the dismissal of what you know in order to bring in brand new fresh ideas. So you literally have to get rid of what you uh, knew in order to come in with new ideas. Einstein's relativity, he says, I don't believe that there's ether in space that conducts electromagnetic waves. I don't, I believe that the speed of light is a constant. These were brand new ideas, and he, he used that to um, generate the theory of relativity. So he had to throw away those old ideas in order to create something which is new. Can AI write screenplays? <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is fun. Uh, this is a uh, headline from a web page. Movie written by algorithm turns out to be hilarious and intense. If you go and uh, search in YouTube for Sunspring, watch it. It is kind of weird, but it's, it's weird and it's, uh, it's uh, I don't know if it's intense, but any of the intensity or the hilarity comes not from the screenplay, but by the skill of the actors. They, they hired A-list actors to act in this. Uh, and so it was the bells and whistles that actually made this compelling. If you look at this headline, you don't get what the script was. I dug deep in the web and I found the following script. See if you think this is uh, hilarious and intense. This, by the way, was, was written by a, by a computer program fed a bunch of scripts of, of uh, science fiction screenplays. He is standing in the stars and sitting on the floor. He takes a seat on the counter and pulls the camera over to his back. He stares at it. He is on the phone. He cuts a shotgun from the edge of the room and puts it in his mouth. He sees a black hole in the floor leading leading to the man on the roof. He comes up behind him to protect him. He is still standing next to him. He looks through the door and the door closes. He looks at the bag from his backpack and starts to cry. I don't know, these are, these are just random beads without a string in terms of, uh, 
in terms of interpretation. Uh, intense, no. Hilarious, only in the sense of its of it being very ludicrous. Uh, here's one which is, is a big topic today, is consciousness algorithmic. I still have a, def, a, a hard time defining consciousness. I'm an engineer. I've been talking to philosophers and trying to get an understanding of what the definition of, of consciousness is, but uh, other people seem to know. But let me tell you what the current viewpoint is into uh, what consciousness is. There's so-called panpsychism. Now, panpsychism, it assumes that everything in the universe is conscious. This remote is conscious. My jacket is conscious. Uh, the chair is conscious to a little bit. It's just like mass. Everything that is created has a bit of consciousness in it. And we are just a, we are just a uh, in some way, we were lucky and we got all, all this consciousness together in one place, and because of that, we're conscious. <laughs> you, can, you can weigh that for whatever you want. But there's people that take this seriously. Uh, a, second, a second approach is integrated information theory. Now, even integrated information theory assumes that uh, consciousness is not computable, which means it's non-algorithmic. But nevertheless, with this non-computability, they are able to take some axiomatic assumptions about consciousness and build up a framework. This is still in its infancy, and I know, having talked recently, I mentioned before Summer brings your, he's not a big fan of the integrated information theory and has an alternate uh, approach that he's proposing. Uh, another one is quantum consciousness. Quantum consciousness is, looks at the universe and says, okay, consciousness isn't computable, isn't algorithmic. Is there anything in the universe that is not algorithmic? And the first person to identify this, I think, was Roger Penrose, the great, the great British mathematician, who recognized that quantum collapse was not algorithmic. So they believe that quantum effects, like quantum collapse, might explain the non-algorithmic components of consciousness. And Penrose goes on and says, maybe with creativity. But none of Penrose's ideas have really ever caught fire, and nobody is pursuing them, to my knowledge. And then I think there is what Theus would uh, subscribe to, which is mind-brain dualism. This is the assumption that your brain is different from your mind. Your brain might be algorithmic. It might have a bunch of computers in it. But there's also a mind which is, which is distinct, or at least there's dimensions of the mind, which are totally ex uh, um, not included in the brain. And this is, a, this is a very interesting field, and I'm just learning about it. There's a whole philosophy of mind, and there's great philosophers such as J.P. Moreland and Agnes Manouge who subscribe to the mind-brain dualism and have written some very scholarly works in its defense. We, uh, we, we, so we have just looked at four different approaches to consciousness. So I think the ball is still up in the air, You've got to define it before you do it, but this is what is going on. The last thing, since this is reasons to believe, I thought I'd talk about things having to do with church. I got a lot of these ideas initially from John Lennox. John Lennox, by the way, um, if you go to our website, mindmatters.ai, I just did a three-sequence interview with John Lennox about his new book called 2084. It's, of course... Later, the 1984, which was the 1948 novel by Orwell, but is saying, well, how will AI affect our world in 2084? He points out a number of interesting aspects here. He says, first of all, the AI church seeks immortality. Have you heard about the idea that you can upload yourself to a computer and achieve immortality? Well, if what we have said is true, you can only upload the algorithmic part of you. And I maintain that if you left the non-algorithmic part behind, you would be a pretty boring person. Uh, just the algorithmic part is no fun at all. Lennox points out that, you know what? The Christian church has known about immortality for a long time. We have a totally different uh, perspective on immortality. So that's what they're trying to do. It's just like building the golden calf and worshiping the golden calf. People are worshiping AI. 
Uh, super intelligence. We hear about super intelligence. AI writing better AI, writing better AI, writing better AI, then eventually going to the super intelligence, marking what Ray Kurzweil calls the singularity, when computers become more uh, intelligent than human beings. You notice that this idea of superintelligence assumes creativity, doesn't it? It assumes that the computer program you write can write a better computer program that you didn't intend. That means the computer program would be creative. It would pass the Lovelace test. So therefore, superintelligence itself is not, uh, is not possible because of the creativity limitations of computers. But uh, Linux points out, hey, we have superintelligence, and we've known about superintelligence since Genesis, and that superintelligence, of course, is God. The AI Church has this Bible. I mentioned Ray Kurzweil. He wrote uh, a book called The Singularity is Near. When he asked, do you believe in God, he, his response is, not yet. He's waiting for the computers to advance to a point where they are godlike, and then he would believe in God. So this is kind of the, kind of the Bible of the materialistic uh, assumption of the, the dystopian future. Another dystopian future guy is uh, Yuval Harari that wrote the book Homo Deus. And boy, you want to be depressed. Uh, read, read Homo Deus about the dystopian future, which is forecast by Harari. Once AI becomes uh, super intelligent and we become its pets, and we will have conflicts with it, like in the Terminator, uh, you know, where Sky, Skynet takes over. Or we will be in a, in a bath, like in the Matrix, distracted from reality by virtual reality. Um, yeah, it's a very... So that, this is part of the AI church. Now, here's something which is very interesting. There is what I would call the AI church as a possible. His name is a Anthony Lewandowski, and he founded the AI, AI church the way of the future. He founded a church based on artificial intelligence. And he gave the Apostles' Creed when he wrote the IRS trying to get tax exemption for his church. And here's what he wrote to the IRS in order to get tax exemption. The AI church believes in the realization, acceptance, and worship of a Godhead based on artificial intelligence, uh, AI, developed through computer hardware and software. It's hard to believe, isn't it? It just shows the extent that those with a materialistic uh, superstition will go to in order to justify their ideology. One of the things about the AI church is that Lewandowski founded is that it apparently didn't have the Ten Commandments because later on, uh, this headline is when I saw Anthony Lewandowski is um, charged with stealing trade secrets. So, no Ten Commandments there. So lastly, let me finish this. I'm going a little bit over. What, what, does, what does the Bible say about, uh, about artificial intelligence? I think there's some things we can glean from there. But I believe that saying the Bible is not a book about science is like saying a cookbook is not a book about chemistry. Cookbooks have information about chemistry. The Bible has information about science, including computer science. Let me give you three, uh, three main issues which I think that the Bible addresses in terms of man's exceptionality. Number one, God gives man dominion over all. That includes AI. You read the second verse here, Psalm 8, 6. You made them rulers. You made us rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. So everything is, is, um, everything is under our feet and nothing is going to be superior to us. I think a second basic premise of Scripture is of human exceptionality, that we are made in God, God's image. Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. If we were to duplicate ourselves, we would, by necessity, be, what, creating something in the image of the image of God? Or if we duplicated ourselves, would, maybe it would have to be in the image of God also. So I think this is a limitation. And number three is that uh, God is the sole source of life. There's a number of scripture verses here. Uh, the last one, Deuteronomy 32, 39, it is I who put to death and give life. So the responsibility of life is solely God's, according to the Scripture. It's the only time I put theology in the presentation. So 
uh, everything else, I think, is, is, is solid philosophy and science. So here's the takeaway. AI is neither good nor bad. Fire is neither good or bad. Um, electricity isn't good or bad. Both of them have their negatives and both of them have their positives. It's the same thing with, with AI. Beware of the hype. AI will exceed human capabilities in many cases. When I got my calculator that added numbers, that exceeded my capability in terms of adding numbers. And we see this, this exceeding of capabilities all the time. But AI will never be creative, understand, write better software, experience qualia, love, compassion, or empathy. There isn't the possibility of duplicating it. And AI will probably never have common sense. And I think that the bottom line is Psalm 139 that says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made, maybe beyond explanation, certainly beyond the capabilities of artificial intelligence. So with that, I would, I would put in a pitch for our website at the Walter Bradley Center for Natural and Artificial Intelligence, mindmatters.ai, and invite you to go there. there. There you will hear podcasts from John Lennox on his recent book, and we've done six podcasts with John Lennox so far, and also a podcast with uh, Walter Bradley about near-death experiences, which I believe is really hard evidence for the Remember we talked about consciousness, this idea of the mind-brain uh, duality? Uh, the near-death experiences are a great evidence of that. So there's a free ebook at Mind Matters in a little bit different topic. I wrote a book called The Case for Killer Robots. It's more of a political versus a, a apologetic book, but nevertheless it's free if you're interested. And if you'd like uh, an audio version or the Kindle version, it's also available at Amazon.com. So with that, I'm finished. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Enjoyed that immensely. My name is uh, John Murphy, so I uh, do have a question for you to start off. We'll have a series of questions and a reminder to our uh, virtual audience to please be sure to send in those questions. Hopefully the banner is at the bottom of the screen now where they have the email address they can see. So. Philosopher of the Mind, John Searle, you mentioned his very famous Chinese room thought experiment. Yes. And uh, the point of that experiment was to demonstrate that uh, he will grant that people, that computers can pass the Turing test and that humans would not be able to distinguish between a computer or a human if they were talking to them. But his point is, is that him inside the Chinese room, he, he doesn't know a word of English. And his point is, is that the computer, or Chinese, the computer also does not know a word of Chinese. And so the question is, the, as I understand it, the materialist response to that is that the system as a whole understands the Chinese, that Searle inside the room is just one part of the system, and from a materialistic perspective, the computer as a system as a whole is able to take the input of the question and then put out the output of a proper answer. I was curious if you could uh, respond to that objection to uh, Searle's analogy. Well, th see, that's the other question. Is there more beyond uh, Searle's Chinese room? What do you do when you do that Chinese, what do you do when you submit that Chinese result and you get the answer? Uh, typically, that result of consciousness is something that you need to do some additional processing about. You need to reason about it. You need to see what, uh, well, first of all, you have to ask yourself, what was the reason that I answered the question? And number two, what am I going to do with the answer? So these are above and beyond the Searle's Chinese Room experiment. I don't know if that addresses you. your question. Yes, thank you. And there is a difference between, I, I should say, uh, duplicating and mimicking David Glentner, who is a computer scientist at Yale, says, I doubt if there's anything AI won't be able to mimic. Will AI be able be, ever be able to love? You can write a simple program to say, let the computer say, I love you. And the computer will say, I love you. Does it experience the love? No, but maybe it can mimic it. Thank you again for uh, coming and speaking to us today. LD Herzog's my name. I'm the vice president of our chapter. Um, just a quick question that I had uh, with regards to uh, artificial intelligence uh, and maybe specifically 
um, this notion of transhumanism, um, where do you see uh, potential dangers uh, with regards to the impact that it could have on us societally, culturally, maybe even theologically? Well, one has to be careful because, again, you're using a word, transhumanism, which means the augmentation of human performance by mechanistic or computer means. Is that what you mean by transhumanism? Yes, in part. I just was hoping you'd explore that idea just a little bit. Well, you know, in, uh, again, a conversation with John Lennox, he says, uh, I'm, I'm bionic. I have a pacemaker in here. Does that, make me, <laughs> does that make me transhuman in some sense? Yes, I think that we are going to be... Um, we are going to be augmented by uh, technology. I don't know if you remember old enough, but they used to have the Jarvik uh, artificial heart, so maybe we can have artificial hearts someday. Elon Musk has a startup company, I forget the name of it, but he's trying to implant uh, little wires into the brain in order to get us better uh, recognition. I don't know about you, I'm not gonna let anybody put little wires in my brain, but uh, that's something that he's pursuing. I don't know where that's going to go. Uh, I would suspect it does, it's not going to go anywhere, but I've been surprised before. So, uh, yeah, I think the transhumanism, um, just the idea of augmenting human performance by technology is, is something which is great if it's used properly. And with regards to the artificial intelligence in general, um, do you see potential dangers? For example, many people will uh, imply that, uh, you know, Alexa is listening to me and the information that's gathered and used uh, potentially in a way uh, that can influence people? Um, do you see dangers in that regard? Yes. You know, th this is interesting. Any Anytime you adopt a technology, you, you adopt consequences. I have long ago surrendered my privacy to Facebook and Amazon. Uh, you know, I, I have to sign up for it, but they're so good that the that the advantages outweigh the consequences. So unfortunately, yeah, we're going to have to face things of that sort. It is a little bit uh, chilling, the loss of privacy, especially what they're doing in China now with the face recognition and the, and the social structuring that they're attempting to do there with face recognition. But again, the AI itself is neither good nor bad. It's how you use it. They're using it for something which is, which is bad. I'll yield the mic to our next question, but um, I guess in a way this pandemic uh, and the mask wearing minimizes uh, face recognition. <laughs> <laughs> it probably does. That's a good point. Hi, I appreciate your talk. I'm Amy Hardy. I'm one of the officers with the chapter. Okay. Um, so I had a question. Speaking of John Lennox, I listened to an interview with him. Uh, with who now? John Lennox. John Lennox, yes. Yes. Uh, interview on his book, uh, 2084. And he mentioned the facial recognition and a lady doing research with emotional recognition by AI. And they, the benefit for that is recognizing emotions could help them detect an oncoming seizure in these uh, people with uh, issues with seizures. And you mentioned the non-algorithmic part being emotions. And so just wondering, and with the facial recognition, being able to detect emotions with the China thing, um, as far as this could be a mark against a person if they were employed by someone, detected negative emotions. So I was wondering your thoughts on that and how far you see that I going. think facial recognition is going to be really, yeah, it, it has a number of uses. I have a friend, uh, Michael Ignor, who, by the way, writes for us at mindmatters.ai. He's a neurosurgeon in New York City, or New York, no, I'm sorry, in, in a New York University, New York, uh, Stony Brook. And he wants to use facial recognition to look at potential consciousness of patients in comas. So the patient will be there in comas, and he says there are micromuscular movements that can be addressed through facial recognition that can give clues whether the patient in a coma is, has a degree of consciousness or not. So yeah, that, you know, that, that's another example. So it, again, the facial recognition isn't good or bad. Uh, my wife is not a computer whiz. She loves when she turns on her 
computer that looks at her face and says, yep, that's you. I mean, that's facial recognition too. So I think in both cases, those are probably pretty positive. The China, the China that's a negative application. You, know, you see that with everything. We use electricity today, but electricity, there's still frayed wires and houses burnt down, and people still get electrocuted from down power lines. And so these are the things which are going to have to mitigate it, be mitigated by people outside of the engineering AI development community in order to control their use in the future. Do you see hope in that community as far as establishing an ethical standard as we move forward with the AI? One of the things we have to remember is that ethics never resides with the artificial intelligence. AI is never the responsibility of the artificial intelligence. It is the responsibility of the programmers, the people that test the AI systems, and the end users. They are responsible for the ethics. And that, uh, that is, again, above and beyond the capability of AI. AI is, doesn't have ethics associated with it. It needs to be imposed by human people. I guess that's the only kind of people there are, right? Human people. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I uh, appreciate you bringing up the topic of ethics. Uh, it's not the computer that's doing it. It's the people behind the computer. Yeah, thanks. I found it kind of interesting. A synonym for artificial is fake so or <laughs> false. So I'm kind of curious, how did the term or name artificial intelligence come up with? Is it just because it was man-made? I wish I had the answer. I know where to go to look for the answer, but I don't remember it exactly. Certainly the first major movement for artificial intelligence was in the 1950s at MIT from Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert. They are the ones that founded the AI Intelligence Lab at MIT. And I remember there was a meeting sometime of some very prominent computer scientists that said, yeah, we'll have this AI thing knocked out in a couple of weeks. <laughs> and that was, that was a long time ago. So it was a much more difficult problem than they, um, than they anticipated. But I'm not sure of the exact word origin, but I do know that it was popularized by Minsky. Sure. Uh, and they were using something totally different. They were using so-called rule-based systems. Their idea of artificial intelligence was you get an expert, and you ask this expert, how do you do this? How, how do you trade the market? They say, well, I look, at, I, I look at this indicator, and if this one goes up, this one goes down, I buy. And so they write that into computer code. And they sit there and they query this expert for a long time and try to capture this expertise in computer code. And that was early AI. That was before any of the connectionist work of people like Bernie Woodrow and uh, Frank Rosenblatt in the, uh, in the early 1960s. And there was literally a conflict between them. The connectionists did not like the, the rule-based systems and uh, Minsky and Papert wrote a great book called Perceptrons, and they tried, to, they tried to derail neural network research. And because of their book, it turns out that neural network funding in the United States from the government went down, but they also got hit by their own ricochet, and Minsky and Papert's work also, their funding also went down. So uh, there, was, there was a great AI winter in that era uh, between the 60s and the, and the late 60s. Uh, one other question. In uh, the beginning of your uh, talk, you mentioned that you weren't going to touch on the subject of love or feelings uh, within AI. And I was just curious, uh, do you see any future where there is advancement, where computers are going to be able to do any kind of feeling or emotion like that? I don't uh, see that, but I think they can mimic it. There was a great They can mimic it, sure. They can mimic yeah. it. Okay. There was a great movie, AI, by Steven Spielberg and I think uh, Kubrick, where there was a little boy robot that was trained to love. And it was played by the same kid that played the role in I See Dead People. Remember that one? Uh, and he's just an incredible actor. But there was a little button that was pushed that turned on the love of the little boy. And one of the things I mentioned but didn't get a chance to elaborate on was the seductive optics. And that little boy had such seductive optics to show that he was in love with his smile and his loving look at his mother. And that had nothing to do with the AI that was happening inside. Right. Nothing at all. It was, right. a, it was a mimicking, and, uh, and that was it. Okay. Great. Thanks. 
Uh, we just had a question sent in from one of our uh, YouTube viewers, and I just wanted to pass it on. You referenced a movie. This question states this. You mentioned several movies and books about AI. Is there any movie or book more realistic and actual in its portrayal of the truth of the limitations and abilities of AI both now and in the foreseeable future? Uh, yes, there are. I, I, would, I would recommend um, partially John Lennox's book, 2084. Uh, Eric Larson has a new book coming out from Harvard University Press, which is due any day now. I'm writing a book right now on the, on the limitations of artificial intelligence, and that's maybe going to be another year down the road. But I think that the true non-hyperbolic um, uh, treatment of artificial intelligence, the, the works on that is, is pretty small. But those are three things which come to mind. Thank you. Okay, we have another question that's come in from YouTube audience. Um, he asks, where can we expect AI to improve our use of energy consumption? Uh, could you repeat that again? How yes. can we use AI to improve energy consumption? Where can we expect AI to improve our use of energy consumption? Boy, that's something I have very little idea about. I do know that... Uh, well, I can tell you some early work that I did in energy consumption, which was in electric load forecasting. Uh, when we first did the electric load forecasting using artificial neural networks, it turns out that the electric companies were in a quandary. They needed to forecast the amount of power that they were going to use the next day. And they didn't want to underestimate it because if they did, they would have to buy off the grid at whatever the prices were. They didn't want to overestimate it because if they generated too much power, they would have to sell to the grid at the price that was prevailing at the time. So therefore, they wanted to get as accurately an estimate as they could to how much energy was produced. And so there was a lot of historical data, and this historical data contained things such as the, uh, the current temperature, the day of the week, um, uh, the forecasted temperature for the next day, and a bunch of other things you would think which would be relevant to the forecasting of the data. A neural network was trained, and it did incredibly well. And within two years, there were 36 utilities using our basic idea of forecasting, um, for forecasting power load in order to increase their accuracy in forecasting power load. So that would be one case that, I would, um, that, 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 that comes to mind. Great. Thank you. Hi, this is another question from our YouTube audience. I think it may be a little tongue-in-cheek because it has a winky face <laughs> after it. Um, the question is, what can we learn from Tay, the AI that was created by Microsoft and given a Twitter account? And he clarifies that it was a disaster. So is there anything we can learn from that? I know nothing about AI that has a Twitter account. I did, I did mention uh, uh, GTP. Three, which can write very nice, short, um, very coherent prose. It's almost like an elaborate phrase completer. You know, like when you type, your cell phone will give you the new words to all the different words that possibly you mean. This is an extension of this where instead of just the words you need, it gives you a whole paragraph of what maybe you need based on, based on its access to billions of documents. I was reading GP, GPT-3, or GTP-3, was trained on just an enormous amount of data, including all of Wikipedia. But all of Wikipedia constitutes less than 1% of what the program was, was trained with. So this is an enormous database which is being used to write these, uh, these short, coherent uh, sentences. And so, yeah, I, I, uh, maybe this was in the early days of of doing that sort of thing, you know, of getting Twitter accounts, but I'm not familiar with the specific case you mentioned. One more question from our YouTube audience, uh, and then I have a comment after this, but would you let an AI car drive you from Los Angeles to New York as you and your family routinely took naps in the back seat? <laughs> I, I literally have a bet with a good friend that we're not going to have level five self-driving cars within the next three years. I think it might be possible, 
But my heritage is in West Virginia. West Virginia has these long, curvy roads that are carved outside, carved outside of a mountain. And they're single lane roads, yet when you're driving one way, you'll see a logging truck come the other way. And you've got to sneak over to the edge just before you fall off the edge to let the logging truck by. I don't think that that level of five driving car is going to be, is going to be realizable, uh, at least in the near future. The only way that it's applicable is if you change the environment. You're going to have to put out sensors on the road and things like that. But a self-contained level five driving car, self-driving car, is going to be very difficult at that level. I believe that it's probably pretty easy to generate level five, and I don't even know, I, I don't even know if you would call it a level five, um, but a level five driving car that goes on highways. Because if you think about it, it's not that difficult. You're like on a railroad track. You have lines on one side and lines on the other one. That's your track. You're cognizant of things to your right and your left and before you and behind you. And you can keep up with, uh, you, you can keep up with that. So yes, I would be comfortable doing that as long as we avoided country roads in West Virginia. Uh, Melanie, w one last comment uh, from my 90-year-old mother. <laughs> she said, God created man, man created AI. She didn't quite understand how you can connect the dot between AI and God, so. Okay. <laughs> uh, this is John Murphy again. I think along those lines, I think there was a news article this week talking about the failure of uh, some self-driving vehicles and the number of accidents that they were unable to avoid. So clearly that technology uh, has a way to go. But one of the things we, we, we didn't mention, uh, which is the dangers. AI is going to have dangers. And one of the dangers is the unintended consequences. And we see this every time. You have, you have AI spam filters. And how many times have you gotten a message that went to junk mail that was important? It screwed up, right? That was something which was not intended. And that was relatively mild. But in self-driving cars, you have wind-blown plastic bags mistaken as deer or stationary plastic bag recognized as rocks. You had in 19, I think, well, 2018, the Uber self-driving car that killed a pedestrian. And what is the danger in that? The danger in that is the broadness of the AI. It turns out the broader you attempt to make artificial intelligence, the more of these unexpected contingencies happen. We just did a paper on this, which was fascinating, but the contingencies increase exponentially as the complexity increases linearly. So when you try to do relatively large AI systems like self-driving cars, you're going to have a lot of consequences that you're, not, uh, that you're not aware of. This speaks badly against general artificial intelligence, even if we, or super intelligence, even if we were able to do it, which I don't think which I've mentioned that is, is not doable. But there would be an incredibly large artificial intelligence system with uh, unexpected contingencies all over the place. So the, the, the success that we see in artificial intelligence is to narrow sort of applications. And those narrow applications can be very, very successful because they can be thoroughly tested. This gets back to the ethics. You have to be able to test the artificial intelligence to make sure it does exactly the way that you programmed it to do. Thank you. So I'm going to do my best to formulate this question I'm, uh, to make sure that it's clear. And I'm wondering if the difference between those who believe that artificial AI will become self-aware and those who believe that uh, it never will is uh, merely philosophical. And so what I'm thinking is that you noted before that uh, in the movie, the young boy in the movie AI was able to mimic emotions. Yes. Right? And so I, I think a person who's arguing on behalf of strong AI would say, well, what if the computer is able to mimic qualia or mimic understanding or mimic creativity. At that point, is it strictly a philosophical difference between the two, or do you think that it's not even, it's, it won't ever be possible for a computer to mimic those sorts of qualities? Well, again, I think, uh, I, I agree with Galentner, probably anything could be mimicked by AI. 
but it doesn't mean that it will be duplicated. So um, I think we're also stuck with the idea here of definitions. What, what's, what's, what's the difference between uh, literally duplicating and mimicking? And if we define duplicating as actual, the actual experience of qualia, no, that's not going to be impossible. Now, there's some people that believe that maybe uh, computers are not complex enough. Maybe if we had a more powerful computer, there would be an emergence of some of these properties. That's a very common assumption also. But there's no evidence of that. Uh, there's areas like swarm intelligence and uh, artificial life, which have been totally failures at showing this emergence from randomness. And so, no, that doesn't appear that it's, uh, that it's possible. And it reminds me of the old story about the Christmas pony, wherein there was this, there, there was this very happy kid that was put, put in a room full of horse manure. And he was really optimistic. And he started taking this horse manure and throwing it over his shoulder and, and saying, this is exciting. With all this horse poop here, there must be a pony in here somewhere. And so I think it's the same thing with AI, that if you get enough AI, that there has to be some sort of emergence of quality or of qualia or creativity or something in there. But there's no evidence of that happening. Thank you. Just a quick check to see if we have any other. Okay, well, I think that we are going to stop it here. Again, thank you so much thank for you. taking the time. It was truly really wonderful. For our viewing audience, keep in mind that uh, Dr. Sarah Salviander will be here in September. We'll be sending out emails with those details as well as the location of uh, the, main, the ministry center here at uh, Main Street Baptist Church in Georgetown. And uh, thank you very much for your attendance. We'll sign off here. Thanks.